But good morning, everybody. I'm going to start off today talking again about Hurricane Lee because this animation here, which shows you the satellite data on Sunday, just as the sun was setting there and then overnight last night, are revealing some important things about what Lee has been up to. First of all, it keeps fluctuating uh, over this weekend in its strength. It was, of course, Cat 5 on Friday. At one point, it was downgraded all the way to Cat 2 over the weekend, and it's still looking like a very healthy hurricane, as you can see right in through here. But what I'm concerned about is this. In the newest National Hurricane Center update, do you notice how closely spaced together these intervals are that we're forecasting the position of Hurricane Lee? So it's basically every 12 hours as you look through it here. And what's concerning to me about this is that this may slow down enough to miss the interaction with the deeper trough we talked about all week last week that's coming into uh, you know, Lake Huron soon and then into the Northeast after that. And that's gonna change the position as to where Lee could potentially hit. Now, quick reminder, when you look at these maps, the cone that's shown to you here, this five-day forecast cone, uh, that just represents the historical error. So the size of that cone is always the same in every forecast. It just represents uh, National Hurricane Center historical forecast error. But you notice that we'll be talking about Lee all week long again. So this will be a full second week of discussing Lee before it even comes close to hitting uh, U.S. shores. So by 2 a.m. Saturday, we're still expecting it to be pretty far away. Now, some of the new ensemble data is revealing what the shift in the speed of Lee is going to do. And this is what I want to show you. So this is using the Zero Z, the kind of the super ensemble blend, the European, the GFS, the UK Met Office, and the Canadians. And we can see where each of those forecast members is taking Lee's uh, eventual track. And the models have been pretty consistent over the weekend, suggesting that once we get into next weekend, okay, we're out here on the 17th and 18th, we're going to be watching for the potential landfall somewhere between, I actually like the oval, I'm not going to draw over it, so somewhere between uh, maybe Boston up through Maine and then into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. This is likely going to be the area that we're going to see the influence of Lee. Now, as always, as Lee moves farther to the north, there'll be an extra tropical transition, which means it'll lose probably its its very warm core. It'll lose some of its hurricane characteristics. We do not expect winds to be what they are now, which is like 120 and possibly even stronger. We expect them to, to weaken. That's very common for a system as it approaches uh, the northeastern United States. But you can see that some of the forecast members are kind of taking it back in that direction, right? So initially we thought it would stay out here. Now we're starting to see it sweep back uh, kind of toward the coastline. So we just need to have a talk about this and see what's going on and then monitor it all week. This is the situation we're in right now. So we go back to the steering currents, right? So here's Lee. This is the mid-latitude jet stream. And as I play this forward, there's the trough we talked about. This is its position by Wednesday, and this is going to drop some very cold air into the Midwest and the Great Lakes states. We'll show you that in a second, but there is a frost risk with this. And we see that that trough gets farther to the east before Lee makes it to the north. And as a result, these two do not interact as well as they had been last week, which meant that Lee, which a week ago was getting brought into this trough and yanked out, we now see a little bit of separation here. So that trough exits and Lee's still kind of left in its wake, but not fully interacting. So what we have to see is what that means. So see, it's all the way out here over the North Atlantic. That's where the jet speed max is. And Lee's still spinning on the on the southern and, and, and southwestern side of it. So not the full shredding of Lee, the tearing apart and the pulling to the North Atlantic that we saw a week ago. But there's another trough coming. And this one's by you know Friday night to Saturday dipping in here. And that one doesn't get there in time. So Lee's just going to follow its steering current, which it kind of sat in this interesting saddle point in terms of the flow. But it's going to be dominated more by this ridge. And that ridge is kind of just helping push it uh, farther you know, to the north. So there wasn't much more guiding it than to have it just do that. Now just remember, it will transition with time. This isn't going to... I just want to be aware that you may see images or may... Uh, see other folks talking about this is just a massive landfalling herc. It's not going to look like it does now when it gets this far north, but it's going to be a significant event. For rainfall totals, it's also going to be significant here in terms of wave action, beach erosion, and uh, we will get stronger winds with this. We'll take a look at what they're expected to be in a moment. But then Lee moves out as this next trough dives into the Midwest and New England and finally gets sheared apart over the weekend. So that, that's it. That's the latest I've got for you on the evolution. And the most important thing is the disconnect we see over the next few days here. That's all. That's Thursday, by the way. <laughs> Just amazing to see how little this hurricane is moving over that time. Now, one part of this is going to be the waves. And so what you're now watching color-coded here represents the wave height. 
So if I just kind of take you through Thursday and Friday, we see that this shading of color here is 10 to 12 feet. So notice that along the Carolina coast, getting up here through uh, all the way to New York, we're going to be watching out for just offshore wave height to be 10 to 12 feet. <clears throat> this is going to be a, having a major impact on, on traffic across the open Atlantic uh, as well. Uh, we expect winds here on Lee's uh, right-hand side or eastern side to be 45 to 50 feet. That, that's pretty common with such a powerful system. But then as you can see, as this moves north, we're going to be seeing waves coming up against Cape Cod and then following the whole northeast shoreline here through New Hampshire, then Maine, that could possibly be up here in this 15 to 20 foot range. So these are these are the waves, not surge. This is the wave. Uh, and so this is going to be, this is going to pack a punch and it's going to get into New Brunswick. It's going to hit Nova Scotia here and maybe even impact Newfoundland, which is right over here. So we've got a lot to be watching here with the power and strength of this particular system. On the wind side of it, I'm going to show you cumulative wind gusts, but I wanted to show it to you for the whole country so you can get an idea about other places real quick. So let's just play it forward throughout this week. This is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you can see that while we're expecting winds right here on the northern periphery through the weekend to be up here in this you know 50 to 70 mile an hour range, as with normal, hurricanes tend to dissipate in their strength once they get close to land and they make landfalls. So will we get gusts in here of 50 to 60 miles an hour? I believe so. Uh, but will it maintain what it is down here, which is off my color bar, which stops at 102 miles per hour? Um, I don't I don't think it will. They'll be strong up until it approaches this area, but that's what we're going to be watching out for this week. Now, take a look at the rest of the country. Look at the Canadian prairie. Very little in terms of synoptic scale winds, in fact, almost calm at times right into this area a lot of this is associated with some storms we'll talk about those next and uh, just some stronger winds coming through the midwest and uh, northern plains associated with the front We've also got some windy conditions just offshore in california as well but i want to tell you something about the west you see all this action up here these stronger winds this tells us where the jet stream is making its turn coming into British Columbia. And as a result, this is going to leave much of the western United States pretty dry for the next week outside of some isolated storms that will throw up there's, uh, you know, updrafts on the mountains here. Okay, so uh, let's go have a look at the other part of the tropics and then we'll, we'll get back to um, a few other pieces here. The um, other system, Margo, that's named is expected to move north and get back up to hurricane strength. We do have a system that just came off of the west coast of Africa that's expected to roll through here, 50% chance of survival, and 97L it's got a 10% chance of going. So this was the time period I said because of the MJA movement, we were not going to see a lot of tropical system development. These two systems came on before that, but these next two, I think, are going to struggle against some... Um, you know, less than favorable upper air conditions, in other words, suppression in the atmosphere uh, that um, just temporarily will kind of keep a small lid on what's going on. What I mean by that is today, uh, technically, I believe the September 11th, I'll have to go look, sometime between the 11th and the 15th is the climatological peak in hurricane season. So to see these systems weaker than this uh, shows us that, uh, or weaker than they could be, shows us that the season um, has an impact on it right now called the MJO transition. But that's not going to last very long, and it's pretty weak. For the rest of this season, this has been the piece that has been, you know, uh, and most important to watch, how warm the Gulf is. And the problem here has been we've had a lot of wind shear. So systems have not been able to really get cranking. We haven't had convection out of the Bay of Campeche or something coming off of the Greater Antilles. So just keep an eye on it uh, as we go forward. But the next uh, 10 days, nothing coming out of the Gulf at this point. So you have Lee, Margo, the one that's got a 50 to 80% chance of getting going here once it gets out into the open Atlantic. But outside of that, we do not see any major U.S. land uh, interaction here, except for what Lee is going to do. Okay. All right. Let's now take a look at some recent rainfall. So I can probably get an update on this. It's a little after 6 a.m. when I'm recording. There we go. So this is the newest data from uh, MRMS. We, it's a way by which we collect radar data and rain gauge data and blend the product. A lot of severe weather here, 7th, 8th, and 9th up the East Coast. Numerous reports of severe wind damage and some locally very heavy rain. We have a front that's trying to sag right in through this area. This is where some of the most recent rainfall lined up last night over Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and then these storms that are coming out of the, the plains here. This is a part of a broader system that's going to be delivering some much-needed rain to the hard ribbon or wheat belt. I mean, desperately needed rain to this area. Some of the storms yesterday produced some hail, a lot of small hail, very small hail here, uh, up the east coast but the, the right in through this area 
We had a couple of these uh, storms put down some hail. I mean, you can just see the color coding in there. We were approaching, you know, bigger than golf ball size up to baseball size hail last night. Go to spc.noaa.gov to see the actual uh, reports. But this is where we sit this morning. So the sun was just rising across the East Coast. There is Lee. But I want to take you back yesterday and show you the size of some of these storms rolling out of the plains getting into this region. And on radar, this is what our last 12 hours has looked like. So here's the end of kind of the multi-day thunderstorm event that hit the East Coast. There's the front diving through the Midwest. And this is the first of a couple of pulses of moisture that are going to come through the southern plains delivering some locally very heavy rainfall into this area. Look at that front right now this morning, this outflow boundary from this complex of storms that's going over the Red River Valley to central parts of um, you know, Texas. Okay, so let's pick it up with the high res NAM just to see where this is going to go. So this was this 7 a.m. this morning. Pretty good initialization, I think, on the model. So it's going to give us an idea about what to expect today. So this is through midday today, getting through this evening. So that's the main frontal boundary we're going to keep an eye on. This is being the overnight hours, getting into early tomorrow morning. So that front clears, you know, uh, parts of Michigan, but still draped across, you know, from Lake Erie through Ohio, Indiana, southern Illinois, down in Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So this is coming through again. And uh, that's where we get that front by the time we get out there to Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Now, remember... The speed of this front was what I talked about yesterday, knocking out whatever Lee is. But Lee's not even on the map yet with the NAM simulation. So it's, not, it's, it's way over here. So this is the front that's now too early. The trough that shows up in the Great Lakes too you know, earlier than anticipated. And that's what's uh, kind of working together to make this uh, uh, a, 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 a less of a player in taking over Lee. But as you saw, just watch this again. Look at that rain coming through the midsection of the country all the way down to the southern plains. I bring that up because if you look at the last 10 days of August and the first 10 days of September, we were record dry here in this section of the western Corn Belt and the upper uh, Midwest. And also look how dry we've finished here in, in our hard red winter wheat belt. So that rain that's coming through this area is going to be critical. Now this was all from Hillary, as we talked about. And, uh, but th those two really dry regions, well, one of them is going to be getting relief, and it's this one down here, partially, mostly on the southern side of this, okay? So there's going to be pockets of Kansas that do get a front coming through, but don't get the full relief uh, that I am expecting from some of this rain down here a bit farther to the south. And that just brings me back to the latest drought monitor, because we just have to keep an eye on this. We have 51% of the land area in the lower 48 in drought. And as we discussed last week, we talked a lot about the long-range forecast. We are expecting relief in the drought here and possibly in the mid-Atlantic late season. I'm talking about fall and winter drought relief coming into um, you know the Midwest. But a lot of this is going to be eliminated throughout winter because of the storm tracks we're expecting. My biggest concern is the drought development in the Pacific Northwest as we go through winter. But right now we're at 51%. If winter pans out the way I'm anticipating, we'll likely start spring with under 30% of coverage in drought. I think that would be the case. But just to show you what's still going on here, this is the latest 40 centimeter root zone soil moisture map. And it's busy, but I want to focus on this area right in through here. This is the drainage district. This is the watershed for the Mississippi and its big tributaries. And right now, if you come down to Memphis, as we've been keeping an eye on, the Memphis uh, gauge in the USGS uh, from the USGS is at minus 9.9 feet. So remember, a year ago, we touched this line right down here. And that happened once we got into uh, late October. A year ago today, we were at a foot above low stage, and then we began the dryness. We've already started it early this year. We're down to 9.9 .9 feet below low stage, and that's you know that's just the major concern as to what what could potentially be happening uh, this upcoming fall with Bard. We got to watch this carefully, and the reason is is here. Okay, this is your next uh, seven days. Very wet conditions here, but. You know, we got a front coming through, but most of the rainfall totals are less than half of an inch. You look at my color bar, less than a half inch in through this area. We're drier in the southeast. We're drier across the west. All the flow is coming into British Columbia. The Canadian prairie is drier as they're finishing harvest in this area. And then this is Lee. So this is not going to be accurate for Lee, but we do see a broad area here of one to, you know, getting up here to three inches of rainfall right now. It could become much more as we watch the forecast evolve. So speaking of the evolution of the forecast, let's go to the upper level heights and see what they're up to. So this is the trough that skips through and leaves Lee. See, that's already here, and Lee is not connected with it. 
So then we watch the next one, which is there. And this is the, the, the issue. If the flow's coming around like this, you can see how both the ridge that's on this side and the trough that's here are gonna help take Lee straight into that direction. And that's what's gonna make the play on, I mean, it could be from Cape Cod through you know, Maine, getting up to New Brunswick, Nova Scotia again. But this is another shot at some cooler air coming in this weekend in the Midwest, while the West starts to heat under this ridge. Now, early next week, there's a broad trough over the east, a lot of dry air coming in on the back side of this trough through the Midwest. But we're going to watch here as we transition toward this uh, equinox uh, on the 21st to kind of a new pattern. The models were kind of consistent with this over the weekend. The development of a trough feature here. So that means the flow is going to dip down and run up over a ridge, which means we're going to continue this, you know, we all use this term, but it makes sense, this roller coaster ride of temperatures. So we started off September hot, then we've gotten cool in the Midwest, and then it's going to go back over warm again, and then it's going to do the same thing and cool off again at the end of the month. It's just going to continue to do that as we go forward. But with that as the setup, this is the multi-model analysis, GFS on the left, European on the right. So playing this through, we've already watched the next couple of days. So there's the first front that comes through. We can see where the GFS has Lee versus uh, the European model. We then watch later this week as, now look, big high pressure comes in here, really dropping the temperatures off. I'll talk about that in a second. But you can see the stuck front. It's right there. So we're going to continue to get rain all along you know, this side of that front, even down in the southeast. Why is it raining here? The mountains are helping lift the air in addition to the front. So as we just play it forward, this is Thursday, getting into Friday. And if you're watching over here with me, this is just an area that we expect to continue to stay wet. Both models are kicking off another low. Over Ontario, there's the front position by Friday night. And the only difference in the models for Lee is that the GFS is a bit farther to the north than where the European model is. So the GFS is trying to move it along. It's normally progressive, so we expect that. Now, the GFS simulation is really diving this thing its left hand side right into you know Cape Cod, Boston, getting up here like Portsmouth and, and then eventually into uh, the Maine. Um, and the European is there, but it's a little bit farther east and a little bit later. okay? And while that happens, another front comes through this weekend in the Midwest and that'll be the one that eventually just yanks this thing out. So that's a week. You just saw a week there, but let's look at 10 days. European model. Remember, we do have two fronts that do come through this area, but overall, that flow is a bit too dry. So they come through, they bring in some moisture, but you look over a 10 day time period and compare it to historical averages, most of this region and through here is drier than average. We just have, remember, the big high pressure cell to the south of it, better storms and better storms. Drier west, drier Canadian prairie, drier through the Midwestern United States and Great Lakes. All right, out there at the probability maps at 10 days, this is what you're looking at for the best chance of an inch. And this is hitting right on top of some of the harder winter wheat uh, area. Notice it will be missing sections of Nebraska, Kansas, and the farther east you go, the lower those probabilities because the front pushes this direction. If we look on the drier side of it, this is the chance of getting less than a half of an inch of rainfall, less than half of an inch. So now we can identify those same spots. And stretching this out there all the way to week two, we've got our three models here. Um, just tell you, they, they all three kind of paint the same scenario, and they do almost all three look exactly like what the Climate Prediction Center is suggesting. This is the 18th to the 24th. Again, we'll look for much heavier rain here at the very beginning of this time period. But could we see the continuation of above average precipitation at the beginning of it here? Possibly later as the trough develops off the west coast here, that's the chance. But this is going to continue to put pressure on the Mississippi drainage basin as we go forward into late September. Now, as we look out at the jet stream level winds, this is something I, I want to just take a moment to discuss with you. By the equinox, we are seeing, as I talked about all last, all week last week, the jet stream still advertising this, um, this setup where we could call it very El Nino-like. And what I'm talking about here is the position of the polar jet not extending across the Pacific and the subtropical jet very far to the south and then making a hard turn into the North Atlantic. Now, a year ago, the configuration in September, late September, looked like this. I know it's a, just a little different projection, but whatever. Much more stronger winds coming off of Africa, coming across Asia, zipping off here and extending. Look at that. All the way into Alaska. And then the subtropical jet was pieced together here, 
but it rolled way up uh, across the, the, the northern plains of the United States in the Canadian prairie and then exited. So what I'm trying to show you is that we had a La Nina last year. Remember that? I mean, we were talking about La Nina last year. This year, all these strong winds are much farther to the south. So the question will be, if we do end up getting flow like this, can we introduce better rainfall across the south, better rainfall into the Midwest late this month into October? We've talked about it. We know that history would be a bit on the side of wetter conditions at times, but it's the next 10 days. It's a no-go. We've got to get out past that to, to see that whole thing set up if you're talking about the drought that's in the Midwest. Uh, and it's going to take a lot to really undo that. So I just wanted to, I kind of wanted to add that into the mix of, of this analysis today. On the temperature side of it, I've got to start showing you these maps again. Everywhere in gray is where they got a chance of dipping below 35 Fahrenheit. And usually we get it below 35, we have some patchy frost issues. So now we're starting to see this in Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan and parts of Minnesota. And that's because these overnight low temperatures this week, well, this was this morning. This is now getting into Tuesday morning. Look, a lot of 40s in through here while the west and east are warm. We then see Wednesday morning. Look at the depth of that cooler air. There will likely be, you know, look at central Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, parts of Michigan and, 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 and uh, Minnesota here on either side showing up with some low 40s and some 30s in place. That's Wednesday morning lows. There's Thursday, so it's another day of it. And then we get out there toward Friday into Saturday. That cooler air starts to make its way east. Now, if you're south of this, this is kind of like the best kind of sleeping weather you can ask for. But um, there is frost risk in this whole area this week. Look how warm the west is. By the end of the time period, the west goes back under a ridge and starts to warm up this weekend. And the daytime highs look something like this. This is Monday's highs, major cool down along the front range. Look at that, 72 in Amarillo, 88 down here in Dallas. That's a cool day in Dallas for this summer. But look at that, by Tuesday, 83, it's actually going to be warmer in eastern Montana, I think. Then Dallas, uh, this is high temperatures on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, Thursday. So get us out there to Friday. Watch the heat come back in the west on the weekend. There's Saturday and Sunday, way up in the 80s and low 90s here in the northwest uh, into Montana by the time we get into this weekend. The five-day sliding average of temperatures, here's your next five days. Let's play it out to day five through 10. That's when the ridge rebounds and warms things up in the west. And then we get out there day 10 through 15, and now we're getting to see that El Nino pattern. Now, look, we talked about this, right? If the jet comes in and stops here, and the subtropical jet rolls across the south like this, and then they finally meet up somewhere over here like this, this is that signal that we tend to see where we have cooler than normal temperatures south as we get into fall and winter and warmer north. That's when we talk about that. That's what El Nino typically does to this pattern, okay? Now, when we look out there at the new data from the CPC, they released this on Friday. I'm going to tell you something. No one's going to get this right. We're not. We're, we're not going to be able to get anything right with the week three, week four. It's transition time period. So I'm going to show you these maps, but tell you what are the real chances of being wetter than average at the end of September and October here? I don't, I don't think they're as high as what would be suggested. They're just using persistence in the forecast, and I would have, I would have done the same thing. Could there be a warm up and then a major cool down late in the month in this area? Yeah, absolutely. So remember, this is all compared to average. And the first week of October is not a warm month, normal, a warm time of year for this whole region. So just keep that in perspective and know that every everyone is going to struggle with a long range forecast until we see the fall pattern really settle in. So please just give everybody a little bit extra grace with this as we go forward. What we do know, though, is that our El Nino continues to build. We talked about it all last week. If you didn't see the long-range forecast last week, go back and watch Thursday and Friday's videos, and you'll see what was projected. I'm waiting on the CPC to do their update later this week, so we'll kind of use that as maybe more of an official forecast. It's a good blend of whatever we're seeing, but I want to talk to you about something. So we have El Nino going here. Remember, El Nino's happen when there's a weakening of the trade winds. So that arrow pointing from the west to east is in the opposite direction that the trade winds typically blow. What's supporting this is you see this cooler water here? The Indian Ocean right now has very, very strong winds coming out of the east toward the west. And they don't normally do that either. Normally, the trade winds, okay, uh, the way they flow across the ocean here are strongest here, and they're a bit weaker on this side. Well, right now, these are on just steroids. They're just screaming across the open uh, Indian Ocean. Now, I'm going to draw this uh, in the vertical. So understand, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing above this. 
But what this typically does is this causes sinking motion here, and then it causes rising motion there, and rising motion here. And then the flow is completed by coming back like this. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I drew that last arrow the wrong way. Ah, come this way, <laughs> forgive me. So get rid of that. Now, the point behind me showing you this circulation is that's what the atmosphere is up to when there's an El Nino. And what this tends to do, now let me draw it on the plane view, is crank up the subtropical jet right there and split the polar jet over the top like this. And this is what makes the risk in the Pacific Northwest of being drier. This is what gives you a little bit more mild conditions at times across the north, but this is what keeps the south just cranked with systems. So our El Nino is here, and I want to point out that these blue-green colors, if we had a La Nina, take this and put it all in through here. We don't have that, though. These are in the Indian Ocean representing those winds. And these reds represent these little westerly wind bursts that keep coming out, indicating the development of our El Nino. And it's going to continue to get stronger over the next probably 90 days. And it'll start to weaken after late December into January. That's what typically happens with El Nino events. Now, what is this going to do in the meantime? Okay, it's going to affect several things. It's going to affect the biggest storms over parts of Southeast Asia, Australia. It's going to affect the African monsoon. It's going to affect the timing of the southwestern monsoon down here. Excuse me, the Brazilian monsoon uh, down here as well. And it will eventually affect the jet stream pattern across North America. What I'm going to play for you, though, is probably one of the more significant things I've been concerned about. And it's right down here in southern Brazil. That was round two of rainfall in southern Brazil. This is round three. And then at the end of this animation, while it's appearing drier right now, round four and five are about to slam into southern Brazil. Now, what's important to see here is that some of the flooding conditions already in like Rio Grande do Sul, parts of Paraguay, northern tip of Uruguay have been just horrific. And then you watch this. There is another two rounds of rain hitting that same area that could possibly add another six inches of total rainfall. So this down here is, is record wet and flooded out, and it's going to be a problem for a while. Infrastructure damage on the Parana River, this isn't good. Meanwhile, to the north, it's raining in this part of the Amazon, but not into most of Mato Grosso or uh, Goyas, Tocantins, Minas Gerais. This is too light of rain to get the season started. We need a whole lot more here. And some of the moisture that came in before, this was back at the end of August, it's not still there to be used. So even though they can start planting in four days, um, we're not we're not getting it. By the way, I got a good question about this. Um, they can, uh, the reason why they typically don't let the ground lay fallow dormant up until September 15th is primarily for disease pressure. Uh, they, that's a good way to help eliminate it. And they typically have to wait on the moisture to get there anyways. So the government says September 15th is the start, except for a few growers this year got to start on September 1st. But it is dry in this area. Please take note of that. And I want to just repeat again what the concern would be if this El Nino uh, cranks up like it could. We could see drier conditions across a lot of Brazil's northern growing areas at the start of this season. This is October, November, December, while we continue to stay wet in southern Brazil and down into Argentina. Now, this would be curing long-standing drought in the south, be it, albeit due to flooding. But I want to be very clear on something. Even if this area received half of its normal rainfall, so just half, it's still got enough to make a crop here. So unlike the Midwest where I live, if we got half of a rainfall, we would have, I mean, we would have devastating drought on our crops. That's not the case in the monsoon. The flow that typically comes in here can produce several inches of rainfall and a lot of it's excessive. So I just want to be clear on this. We got to watch it carefully. Planting progress is going to be key. All right. Thank you for sticking with me a long time here on Monday morning. I hope you'll have a good rest of your week. We'll talk again tomorrow. Thanks.